Hi guys and welcome back to the YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Emil and I recently graduated from Scotch College in 2020 with an ATAR of 99.8 and a 99th percentile UCAT. In this video, which will be the second of my UCAT crash course, I'll be talking about how I approach the verbal reasoning subtest on the UCAT and the strategies that I use to answer questions and to do well on this subtest. This video is going to be separated into three main sections. At the first section, an overview of the verbal reasoning subtest and what the main difficulties and challenges are in this subtest. The second part of this video will be me giving you some general tips and advice on how to complete questions in this subtest. And then the third part will be me completing some questions live on camera for you to see how I answer questions in this subtest. Without further ado, let's get straight into a general overview of the subtest. In general, the verbal reasoning subtest was one that I found very difficult on test day. In fact, it was actually my worst cognitive subtest. But that being said, having done the verbal reasoning subtest, I do think I have some good advice to give about how you should be approaching the subtest. In general, the verbal reasoning subtest is one that measures your ability to be able to extract information from a passage and then to apply that information you've extracted to a statement in a question. The verbal reasoning subtest is comprised of 11 passages of text, each with four questions each which means that you have a total of 44 questions to complete in 21 minutes. This gives you approximately 30 seconds for each question and two minutes usually for each set. There are two types of questions in the verbal reasoning subtest. The first is the more complicated and more common one, which is the reading comprehension question. And then the second is the less common and slightly easier question, which is the true false can't tell question type. In all of these question types, you'll be presented with a stimulus. But in reading comprehension question types, you'll be presented with four free text answer options, which you will then be required to choose from. In the true false can't tell section, you'll be just presented with a statement and you have to decide whether that statement is true, false, or whether you can't tell. In general, this subtest is quite challenging because it is one of the most time pressured of the subtests. All the subtests in the UCAT are time pressured, but this one you feel it especially so, just because there's so much reading to be done in the stimulus. Because of that, a lot of people find it really difficult to actually find the information you need to get from the stimulus and then to apply that information to the question, which is probably the main challenge of this subtest in the first place. Another challenge of this subtest is that the question stems in these questions can be very misleading. Sometimes question stems contain words such as only, always, and except, and these strong qualifying words means that some answers cannot be selected even though they may appear to be true. Now that I've given you a general overview of what the verbal reasoning subtest is like, I'll move on to my general tips on how to approach this section. In general, people have a lot of differing views about how you should approach questions in verbal reasoning. Some of the two main ones are one that you should read the passage first and then the other one is that one you should read the question first. I personally always read the question first in verbal reasoning and I felt this helped me a lot to find the information I needed. But if you think reading the passage first might work better for you, feel free to try that. But in this video, I'm gonna be talking about reading the question first. The general approach I had for verbal reasoning questions was that usually I'd first have a glance at the passage to make sure that it wasn't a passage I'd want to skip. There are often many passages that you'd want to skip in verbal reasoning simply because there isn't really enough time to be answering or spending a lot of time on a complex passage. And these complex passages often contain really confusing scientific terminology or subject specific jargon that can make it really difficult to extract the information you need from a specific passage. So in that case, the first step I'd always take is to glance over a passage and see whether it's something I'd want to answer. If it wasn't, I'd skip the four questions and go on to the next passage, which hopefully I'd be more willing to do. Now, carefully scanning the question stem would allow me to do three main things. Firstly, it would allow me to get a general idea of what the question was asking. And secondly, it would allow me to find out what keywords I should be scanning for in the passage. And finally, it would give me an idea of whether this question would require me to have a grasp of the whole passage or just a specific part of the passage. Reading the question stem first, in general, I found helps you simplify the passage a lot, lot more and also makes it so that it's not as daunting to read through or skim through the stimulus. The second thing I do once I had identified the keywords from the question stem is I'd skim the stimulus really actively, looking for those keywords and pinpointing the sentences around them. Once I'd say, for example, found a keyword in the passage, what I would do is I would read the sentences around it to try and get a general idea of what the keyword actually is or what's going on in the keyword in context. 
And I feel like finding that context in verbal reasoning is really important and often in that, you'll in itself find the answer to the question. Once I'd looked at the sentences around the keyword, what I would do is then return to the question stem and try to answer the question and figure out which answer option suits the question the best. I have to say though that sometimes keyword searching can lead you awry just because sometimes you find the keyword in a passage and you find it in the sentences around and you find the context but that doesn't mean that there might be context in the other parts of the passage that might be relevant to the keyword that can lead you awry and give you the wrong answer. This is especially true for true false can't tell questions where sometimes you'll have a statement around a keyword that might lead it to be true or false, but then there'll be some statement upwards in the passage that will mean that it's actually can't tell. Now that's a general example of how keywords can lead you astray, but in general I find that when you're not aiming for 100% in the UCAT anyway, it really does help a lot to just keyword search because you can seriously get like 90, 80% of the questions right. Now that I've given you the strategy on how to approach the questions in verbal reasoning, I'll give you some tips for how to approach this subtest in general. The first tip I have to give you guys is that you have to look out for logical fallacies in verbal reasoning. Now, a common logical fallacy you can find in verbal reasoning is that if X is Y, Y is X. And another one that can be is that if X and Y happen together, then X caused Y. Now, these are both not true and you must be careful to avoid these at all costs. Now, the second tip I have for you guys is that you cannot use your outside knowledge at all in verbal reasoning. Using your outside knowledge can often lead you astray because in verbal reasoning, the questions are expected to be derived from the stimulus and the stimulus only. If you think that from your prior knowledge that you can get the answer to the question, it's likely that it can be false or not true or just not that answer option in the reading comprehension questions. Because of this, you have to be really, really actively careful in only taking information from the stimulus in verbal reasoning. My third key tip for you guys is that when you choose a point to read, you have to read really carefully. Now, what this means is that when you're reading the question stem, you have to be watching out for those little tricks like always, only, except. And when you're reading information in the passage, you have to be reading that information really carefully. You can't panic and read over the same line like two or three times because that will cost you precious time and it will also be very inefficient as a method for answering questions. You really, really have to be very focused about what you're reading and how you're reading it if you wanna do well in verbal reasoning. Now that wraps up my general tips for verbal reasoning, but what I'll do now is I'll show you some live footage of me answering verbal reasoning questions so you can get an idea of how I approach the questions and how I think in real time. So as you can see, I've pulled up some practice questions on the screen. These are from the UCAT Consortium official website. So. I think they have a subtest mock for all of the subtests, some practice exams, and then also some question banks. And I'd highly recommend you do these because they're made by the makers of the test itself. So without any hesitation, let's get straight into it. Um, just looking at this question, the first thing I look at is that the question stem. So the town of Cardigan was wet in 1980. Now what I'll do is I'll just scan through the stimulus to look for, I think the keyword cardigan, I think would work and then 1980 would also work, but I'll just start with cardigan, skim through the stimulus. So department, 19, 1881, 1981. And I'm just picking out words that stand out to me like Wales, Sundays, rural Wales, Welsh language, Sunday opening, and then 1989. Okay, so I found cardigan here in the first sentence of the third paragraph. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just reading around it. So it says, by 1989, places which had voted to close the pubs on Sundays in 1975. I don't really know what that is at the moment because I just skimmed through it, such as cardigan had all gone wet. So what this sentence tells me is that cardigan had gone wet by 1989, but I don't know whether it went, it was wet in 1980. So now I'm just going to read about what um, this word wet means. So I'll scan through again for the word wet. Um, okay, so I see here in the last sentence of the first paragraph, local residents could vote on whether to ban Sunday opening of pubs, go dry, or whether to allow them to open, go wet. Okay, so um, now I know what wet means in the context of this question and then I'll see um, 
I see the word vote here and I also saw that in the third paragraph. So I'll have a look at what this voting means. Um, okay. Uh, and I found it. So when this law was repealed in 1961, drinking in Welsh pubs was permitted, but local councils had to hold a vote on the issue every seven years if 500 local residents requested a local referendum. Okay, so now with that information, I know that places which had voted to close the pubs on Sundays in 1975, so they voted in 1975, so I can add seven years to that, I get 1982, so there was no way the town of Cardigan could have been wet in 1980, so this must be false. Now, just a disclaimer, obviously I'm spending a lot of time on these questions, but on the day and with a lot of practice, you get used to doing these much, much faster. With this question, I'm looking at the 19, uh, sorry, the 1881 Act was the only Act of Parliament to apply to Wales and not England. So looking at that, I'll just scan for the 19, uh, sorry, the 1881 Act and it's an Act of Parliament and I see Act of Parliament. And yeah, it's in the first sentence. So an Act of Parliament to treat Wales differently from England was passed in 1881. So I think in this question, it's something I told you guys to look out for really key words is only. So because it says only, it means that even though this act did treat Wales differently from England, we don't know whether it was the only act. So this would be can't tell. Then next question, effectively anyone could buy an alcoholic drink in a dry area in Wales on a Sunday after 1961. So firstly, from the questions I've done before, I know that you can't, you're not supposed to be able to buy alcoholic drinks in dry areas on Sundays, but I think the key word in this question is effectively anyone or a qualifier. And then now I'll look at drinking in a dry area on Wales on a Sunday. So I'm, I'll scan for that. So then I see that first sentence of the second paragraph. In fact, alcoholic drinks were bought and sold on were in Wales on Sundays, but in rugby and other sporting and social clubs and only to their members rather than to the general public in pubs. So what that means is that it's not effectively anyone. So the answer to this one could be would be false. Then the last question of this set, uh, the fact that the areas which resisted Sunday opening of public houses were mainly temperance minded and Welsh speaking suggests that such beliefs were largely cultural and traditional rather than economical or political. So in this one, I'll just search for temperance minded in the stimulus. And so I'm just scanning as I would with any other part of this question. So I see actually, I found another part of this question, Welsh speaking. So it says in remote parts of rural Wales, rural Wales, where the Welsh language was spoken, there was strong tradition of temperance Okay, yeah, temperance minded and Welsh speaking, particularly centered on the many non-conformist chapels which oppose Sunday opening of pubs. So this would support this question actually, but I'm not sure whether it's can't tell or true. So soon the regular customers of the pubs, so based on this economical and or political part of this question, soon the regular customers of the pubs during other days of the week were organized and financed by the breweries to vote yes for the Sunday opening. So this sort of suggests that to me that it wasn't an economic reason because the pubs and breweries wanted the yes for the Sunday opening. So this makes me think that it's true. And then it also says that tourism, hospitality and entertainment organizers, organizations often oppose the ban. So that leads me to believe that it's true. So I'm just gonna skip over the next four questions because they're also true, false, can't tell questions. I'm just going to go to the first um, reading comprehension question, which is this one, and I'll do this set. So reading this one, I said, I'll read the question first and then I'll also read the answer options because that will allow me to get a better idea of what I'm looking for. So using the information in the passage, it can be inferred that the strict settlement was a discovery accidentally, a discovery made accidentally by Bridgman, a device of, to avoid paying land property taxes only of practical use to wealthy landowners unpopular with members of the legal profession. So I'm just going to scan for these sort of keywords. I have a general idea. So I have legal profession, wealthy landowners, paying land and property taxes, um, and a discovery. And then I have strict settlement, ultimately, uh, obviously, and then a bridgeman. So just first sentence straight away, I see throughout history, wealthy landowners have wanted to leave, leave their estates to their heirs. 
there, that's something about wealthy landowners. I don't know if it's only a practical use, but I will continue. Then Orlando Bridgman invented a, sh a scheme to protect royalist estates. So definitely straight away, I know it's not A, it wasn't made ex accidentally because he invented it. Defeated royalists did not want to be forced to sell their property to pay fines imposed by farmers. So then I also know that B is incorrect because uh, it's to pay fines, not for land and property taxes. Then, so this is about the strict or restrictive settlement. Uh, it was adopted by lawyers and landowners, so I know it's not unpopular, so it must be C. I don't even have to really justify it just because the other three are all false. Which of these statements is not supported by the information contained in the passage? I will read these as well. Heirs could not be heirs, sorry. Heirs could not be always forced to renew a strict settlement. No one knew who the final heir to a strict settlement would be. Orlando Bridgman was the first landowner to use the strict settlement. So straight away from the previous question, I know that this or uh, this option about Orlando Bridgman might be false because I've already read about Orlando Bridgman. So I know he invented it, but that doesn't necessarily mean he used it. So straight away, I'm just gonna look and scan for Orlando Bridgman again. So, and maybe inventor, uh, Orlando Bridgman, just scanning for Orlando Bridgman. So no, I don't see Orlando Bridgman again anywhere in the stimulus. So I'd actually have to take, um, I'm actually pretty sure that it will be C, the answer to this question. And for this, I don't even have to see whether the other three are really supported by the passage or not. I'm just going straight off this, um, this hunch that Orlando Bridgman, and then also looking that through in the passage and finding that it's not there at all. Now, a conclusion that can be drawn from the passage is that the strict settlement ensured that each of a man's children shared his property, protected the inheritance of sons rather than daughters, was disliked by lawyers. Uh, so I know C straight away is not true because we saw that it was adopted by lawyers and landowners, it was only used by royalists. I actually would tend to think that this is not true because it's invented a scheme to protect royalist estates, but only is a very strong word and I, um, I'm feeling pretty hesitant about this one, so mainly focused on A and B. So I'm going to scan about these, uh, scan for these two. In particular, I'm scanning for the words um, "man's children," so heir, and then inheritance of sons. Um, land. So work by vesting ownership in trustees for hundreds of years. Uh, the land developed on the land devolved on an unspecified and as yet unborn male heir. So ensured that each of a man's children shared his property. I'd say straight away from this that it's on an unspecified and as yet unborn male heir. So it wouldn't be that each of his children. Um, just I'm just going to keep reading. Uh, I wouldn't do this on test day, but just to make sure. This was usually done when an eldest son reached 21 or married. That keeps pointing to the fact that this is option A would not be true. And there is also no talk about daughters and it's also always about the son. So I'm inclined to believe it's B. And with that, I'll move on. And then finally, which of these statements is supported by the information contained in the passage? The Court of, the court of Chancery was replaced during the Civil War. Um, many, so I'd scan for the Court of Chancery. Many heirs depended on their fathers for spending money. Orlando Bridgman was a lawyer in the Ch Court of Chancery. Straight away, I know this one's probably not true. A strict settlement normally lasted for several generations. I've seen the Court of Chancery, I'm gonna scan for that. The Court of Chancery here in the second sentence. Every attempt to achieve this was barred with the Court until the English Civil War. I, there is no other mention of the Court of Chancery, so this does not, even though it may have been replaced during the Civil War, this doesn't really mean that it has been. It's not very supported. So it's not A. Then I know this is the only mention of Orlando Bridgman in the whole passage, so it's not C. Then B, I'll have a look. I remember seeing that in the last paragraph. So the heir might be bribed to renew the settlement with the promise of a large increase in their allowance, often their only source of income. Yes, that does support the statement that many heirs depended on their fathers for spending money. So that would be B. So now what I'm gonna do 
is I've done eight questions. It took quite a while, but on test day, I would definitely not spend this long explaining stuff. Um, what I'll do is I'll skip forward so you guys can see the answers. Hopefully we got them all right. Uh, we did half of them. I'll end the review. And so we'll see this. Uh, yep, eight correct, because uh, we attempted eight of them. So that's good. So now that you've seen me do some practice questions live on camera, hopefully you'll get a better idea of how people approach verbal reasoning questions and also how, you know, you might find the best way to do the questions yourself <clears throat> based on some of the methods that I was using. If you guys enjoyed the video or learned anything about the verbal reasoning section on the UCAT, please do feel free to leave a like or a comment on the video and subscribe if you want to see more UCAT related content. My next video will be a live video of me doing a whole verbal reasoning subtest mock so that you can see the thought processes that I use and when I'm doing questions really quickly. Thank you guys for watching and see you guys next time.